I'm your host, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools, Bill Cerrone. Here's a look at what's coming up. We'll meet a teacher who was selected as a science communication fellow. Your, your hypothesis is that this reaction is exothermic. Then we'll learn about the vision program of the Santa Barbara County Education Office. And we'll close the show with our calendar of educational events. Caitlin Standifer teaches chemistry at San Marcos High School in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. She brings her passion for chemistry to her students every day. Let's see what's going on. My name is Caitlin Standifer. I am a chemistry teacher at San Marcos High School, and this is my fourth year here. All through high school and into college, I knew I wanted to research marine science, and I went into UCSB as an aquatic biology major. And as I uh, went through the major, I spent a lot of time doing lab research, and I realized that that wasn't really what I was passionate about, the, the actual lab research aspect of it. Once I decided I wanted to become a teacher, I decided to get a master's in education, so I continued uh, to study at UCSB, and I got my master's in education as well as my teaching credential in biology um, there, and then later added a credential in chemistry. I started at San Marcos um, right out of grad school um, teaching chemistry, so I've been teaching chemistry the whole time. It's been great. I did my student teaching here, and so that's how I kind of got my foot in the door. Chemistry would be one of my favorite classes because we get to interact with each other and do lots of labs. I like science because um, there's a lot of labs and experiments that are really fun and I get to work with my classmates to figure out things I've never learned. Um, I like chemistry. We do a lot of fun labs using like flames and elements and all kinds of stuff like with light and colors is really fun. Then the last row. I think the important thing about science in terms of a general education is kind of what we were doing today which is the thought process associated with science. That you look at something, you ask questions about why it is the way it is, you design a way to test the way, you know, it's, it's the thought processes that are trained in a science classroom and the analysis of data to determine a trend. You know, those are the things that I think are really important in a general education. We're trying to decide if this reaction is endothermic or exothermic, right? So we designed an experiment to test if heat was a reactant or a product, which would indicate if it was endo or exothermic. So we're kind of tying this idea of endo versus exothermic reactions with something we learned in the last unit, which was equilibrium and Le Chatelier, which is you know the shifting of equilibrium by stressing one side of the reaction or another. One of the labs we do is a lab that's looking at the idea that reactions in equilibrium can be shifted in one direction or another by applying a stressor. And so by heating up or cooling down the solution that contains that um, dissociation reaction, we can shift the reaction towards the reactants or towards the products, which will change the color of the solution. And so by observing a change in color of the solution, the students were able to determine if the reaction was endothermic or exothermic. Your, your hypothesis is that this reaction is exothermic? Okay, so if it's exothermic, that means that would heat be a reactant or a product? Good, it'd be a product. Okay, so we're, by adding heat, we're shifting the equilibrium in which direction? For comparison purposes, is I might get a separate container that has the original solution in it so you can do a side-by-side -side comparison because sometimes it's difficult to tell like did this get bluer because I've seen it happen so gradually that I can't actually remember what the original color was. Does that make sense? So we are starting our new unit today. We are going to start today with periodic trends. So a trend is a pattern in a certain direction. So it's a pattern with a direction. So if we go back to what Delmar said about um, people all doing the same thing, we're talking about fashion trends, okay? 
So a fashion trend is fashion that is going in a certain direction, right? So we're going to be looking at patterns on the periodic table today. So specifically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing some data analysis. So one of the really important things that scientists do is they collect data and then they look at that data and say, what does that data tell me? Okay. So we're going to be collecting data and we're going to be looking at it and saying, what does this data tell me? What conclusions can I draw from this data? You're going to be looking at some specific properties of these elements. So there's three specific properties we're going to be looking at. The first property we're going to be looking at is atomic radius. So today's process uh, was more about data collection and data analysis and asking them to look at the data that they collected and then make further predictions. And the nice thing about today's activity is that it really relates to what scientists do, where they collected a lot of data and they use that to make further predictions about what they think is going to happen. Um, and it's really nice because the data that they were collecting provides really clear trends. You're going to be looking at some specific elements on the periodic table, and those elements are here on this table right here. We're going to be looking at what happens as we move across the periodic table with these three things. What happens to the atomic radius? What happens to the electronegativity? What happens to ionization energy? And then we're going to be looking at what happens as we move top to bottom down the periodic table. Okay. So technology in the classroom has definitely been a challenge, not because I don't want to use technology, but it's the proper use of technology. Any high schooler can tell you that they're addicted to their phones. And so trying to figure out how to use technology in a way that's effective and not distracting has been a challenge. Um, I found that um, you know, the, the activity we did today, they probably could have done that on their phones. But I decided to use the Chromebooks instead because when they're on their phones, Instagram and Snapchat and text messaging are only you know, a click away. And so by putting it on the Chromebooks instead, you know, they have the opportunity to put their phones away and focus on what we're doing. And so you know, it's things like that where I think there's just a little bit more attention to detail um, that makes a big difference. You know, one of the other things we've been talking about as well is good sources of information. You know, what is a good source of information? Where do you get your information? Is it a valid source? And so providing them with good sources of information um, I think is really helpful instead of just Googling it, you say, here is a good source. Um, and I think that's been really helpful as well. Right there. Good. Atomic radius. So 145 p.m. You know what that P stands for? Mm, no. So P stands for pico. So picometers. Pico. And a picometer is 1 times 10 to the negative 12 meters. Mm. So 145 picometers would be 0. .00. <laughs> of a meter. Oh. That's the radius of a single lithium atom. That's a lot of zeros. Yeah, it is a lot of zeros. So that's why we use these prefixes, because instead of writing nine zeros, we can just say, oh, picometer. It's a lot shorter, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so we see lithium is three, beryllium's four, and boron's okay. five. All right, so let's look at atomic radius first. So moving from lithium to boron, so left to right, what's the trend in atomic radius we see so far? It's decreasing. Yeah. So could we make a prediction about what happens across the whole periodic table? Yeah. Yeah, so do you think that carbon would be bigger or smaller than this? Smaller. Smaller. Great. OK. So we're going to check that later, right? When I first thought about teaching, the thing I was afraid of is that I would get bored because you're teaching the same thing multiple times a day, multiple years in a row. And I'm not bored. Um, <laughs> the students always offer something different. I'm always trying to think of new ways to teach something. Um, I never teach this, the course exactly the same way two years in a row. Um, I'm always trying to make things better and, and change things. Uh, teaching is a lot more exhausting than I ever thought it was. Um, I have a new appreciation for what all of my high school teachers went through. You know, you're on your feet every day, you're interacting, you're basically on a stage in front of your students the entire day. And so it's a lot more tiring than I ever gave it credit for. But it's fun. Um, you know, my favorite part about it is interacting with my students every day and, and getting to know them and um, share my love of science with them.
think you almost yeah, walked me through the rock yep, cycle. got it. I think we've got little clams there. I spent some time this summer aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. My role there was as a science communication fellow. So the Science Communication Fellowship is specifically for science educators. They flew me out to Rhode Island for four days to do a training and to learn more about what I'd be doing, and then I spent three weeks aboard the ship. So my role on the ship was to sit in the control van with the people that were running the operations and to interact with the people that were watching the live stream that we were putting out on the internet. And so they could type in questions and then I would pose those questions to the people in the control van and facilitate those conversations so that people at home knew what we were doing um, and they could feel like they were part of the, the ex exploration experience. I've always had a really sincere interest in ocean research and you know, being in the classroom every day, I've kind of gotten away from that, but it really brought me back to what got me into science in the first place and really got me excited again about research and bringing that research into the classroom. And just being out on the ocean off the coast of my home city was really, really cool. Up there, like four, seven meters, maybe. Oh. What is the Could diameter of Could be like six, your, seven. Uh, it's so alien. <laughs> so let's look at carbon and silicon. So what do we see happen to the atomic radius as we move down? It increases. Yeah, so we may want to revise that a little bit. So every time we do a lesson in the class, I'm try I try and bring it back to, OK, so what does this have to do with the real world? And this one lent itself really nicely to that because you know I was doing data collection over the summer. I was involved in that. I saw it firsthand. Um, but Every, you know, every lab that we do, everything that we learn has a story behind it. There's a, you know, someone who discovered it or you know, someone that started that process. Um, and so it's all, it's history as well as science. Um, and so one of the things that I try and do is talk about my own personal experiences with what we're doing. And I think that helps the students relate to the concept that we're learning. Because sometimes chemistry can be a little bit dry. And so bringing in those real life experiences really helps to bring the subject matter to life. At the beginning of the class, I kind of talked about the importance of data collection, right? Yeah. So one of the things I did this summer is I was on a research vessel. And we were doing a lot of data collection. And we were actually out off the Channel Islands, right outside of Santa Barbara. And one of the things that we were collecting data about was coral data. Because believe it or not, there are corals off of our coast out here. Yeah, corals can live in cold water too. And what we were looking at was the health of those corals. Because as you guys may have heard in the news, our oceans are changing. They're becoming more acidic. They're getting warmer. And the Pacific Ocean is naturally more acidic than the Atlantic Ocean. And so what we were looking at is we were collecting data and there had been data that had been collected a few years ago, and we were going back to those same sites to collect data again to see if the health of that coral had changed because it allows us to make predictions. Okay? So what we're looking at is we were saying, OK, if the oceans are naturally more acidic in the Pacific, let's see how those corals respond in those more acidic environments so we can predict how they will respond when the Atlantic Ocean becomes more acidic. Okay, so that's real life science. That's what we do. We collect data and we use that data to make predictions. Okay, now, how many of you had data that was inconclusive to make a prediction at some point during the lab today? Yeah, do you think that happens in real science? Totally. So what did you have to do before you could make a prediction? Get more data. You had to get more data. Okay, so the project that I was working on this summer is in the middle of that data collection phase. We don't know. We can't make conclusions yet because we don't have enough data. Because sometimes data collection takes time, right? You need to see how those corals change over time, which means you need to take multiple measurements over years and years and years. Okay? So when you see scientific research that's published, that's often the result of years, years of data collection. right? It's not like some scientist came in and was like, I see this happen once, therefore it must be true. It takes a long time. It's a long process. Okay? So data collection, data analysis is one of the most important aspects of science. 
My hope for my students is that they become scientifically literate citizens. I think science is going to play a really big role in political policy moving forward over their lifetime. And I want them to be able to decipher what's true science and what's not. And so just to be able to say, to look at a paper a scientific or scientific research and say, you know, this didn't have a control group or there weren't enough trials. Um, and to be able to decipher that and make decisions based on it. The Visually Impaired Program, run by the Santa Barbara County Education Office's Special Education Program, offers support to students who have visual impairments. Let's meet Robin Wingle and a few of her students. My name is Robin Wingel. I'm a teacher of students with visual impairments for Santa Barbara County Education Office. Under the special ed umbrella that services students with visual impairments uh, from blindness to a more mild visual impairment, ages birth to 22. We offer braille services, orientation and mobility services, we provide adaptations so that students can access their uh, academic materials and curriculum if they aren't able to see the material. What does, what does it mean to write justify? What does that mean? To put your, put your, put your name, name on, on your right, right side of the paper. Only your name? And your like, and date name. and your title and stuff. Mm -hmm. So anything could be right justified. It just means we want to move it to the right side of the paper. What does left justify mean? Move it to the left of the paper. That's right. A lot of what I do is work with Braille students. That takes up probably the majority of my time on my caseload. I teach students how to read and write Braille, how I adapt curriculum materials for students. We do a lot of technology. We teach something that's called the expanded core curriculum for visually impaired students. So those kind of things mean that we help students access uh, fitness and recreation and leisure skills, daily living skills, how to know how to do things that we do every day for ourselves, cooking, cleaning. We go into the community and work on things. How do you make a purchase in a store? I want you to go ahead and write justify and put your name on one line, press enter and put the date. We use a regular laptop with a, a braille display and specialized talking software so that when students are writing, they can listen to all the commands. We, we use the taskbar a lot. We use the toolbar to go to things like file and save and uh, all of the things on the internet. So the talking software, they can listen to that. But then just as we would want to read it and check it and make corrections, we add a Braille display so the students have access to the material that they can read in Braille what's on their computer screen. I was learning how to use a laptop with a software program on it. And um, I was using a special Braille display that um, helps me read what I wrote. I learn about technology and reading and writing. Yeah, I can write like reports and like essays and things like that. My favorite thing is typing and reading. T. Mm -hmm. H. I'm gonna put my velvet one. E. R. N. Mm -hmm. See, you got it. We use note takers, and the one that we have is called a Braille note. And a note taker is kind of like a, a mini laptop or a tablet that we can create files, open files, read books. All right, we're going to read for a little bit, nice and loud, Selena. Okay, go ahead. Drop, drop, mutter. 
I collaborate with a regular ed teacher to determine what's going to be happening in the upcoming week to make sure that we have materials ready, the braille materials, if there are any other things that I need to gather to make sure that if I have to explain something conceptually, it might be a concept that a student doesn't understand um, or that they they don't have access to the pictures to understand. So if we're talking about um, something in science, I may need to gather real life objects and materials so it has more meaning and uh, the child can comprehend and, and grasp all the information better. After I collaborate with the classroom teacher and I find out what worksheets we might be needing or extra materials that aren't text-based curriculum, then I, I talk with um, our Braille transcriber. She's got a wonderful system set up for how to get everything ready and adapting the materials. So we just we just talk. I give her the materials. I will go over them if we need to talk about a special way we want to create if it needs to be formatted differently. The date we need it, and we always just then make sure Stephanie ha she has it to us a few days before, and we bring it out here so it's ready the day that the students would use it in the classroom. My job as a Braille transcriber is to take all print materials, worksheets, quizzes, tests, and turn them into Braille for all of our blind students here in the county. All of the uh, regular peers get their materials in print. So the teachers give me all the print materials, bring them over here to the office, and I transcribe them into Braille. I received this this morning. It's a fraction math sheet for our fifth grade girls. And so it's, as you can see, all of the regular students have this in print. And this is probably homework or maybe something that they're doing in class. So the teacher, they make sure that I get at least a day or two ahead of time. It hits my desk and then I go ahead and take it from print into Braille right here on the screen. I am sending my Braille document over into the embosser and I'm going to have it Brailled for the student. And uh, from print into Braille. So I'll have this tidied up, ready for them to go, and they'll be working on it tomorrow in their classrooms right alongside their sighted peers. Okay, girls, give each other a little bit of space so you're not bumping into each other and hitting each other with each other's canes. Why don't we go to the office, okay? But the office? The front office. Okay. okay, one at a time. Let's see, good cane skills too, okay? My name is Jeff Winchell. I'm an orientation and mobility specialist for the county program for the visually impaired, and this is my 17th school year teaching O&M for the county. All right, good cane skills, hands out in front, figure down the flat part. Good arc side to side, in rhythm with your cane. The basic skills that we work on initially are cane skills, and that's just holding the cane in front of their body and sweeping it side to side so that they provide protection for their entire body from shoulder to shoulder. Um, once they have the basics of cane use down, we start working on the orientation end of things, and that's how to get from point A to point B without getting lost. Um, orientation is obviously a little bit more difficult, but putting the two skills together and doing them both concurrently can be a challenge for a lot of students. Well, actually, I've been working with both of them since they were infants. And initially, we just worked on the skills of pulling up on furniture and standing and walking because they were both crawling by the time um, I came on board with their services. Um, and once they were up and standing around on their own, we worked on spatial orientation, you know, tracking their movement through space and which way their, body are fa which way their bodies are facing. Um, after that, we start working on exploring the interior of their house. We'll then move on to exploring the exterior of their house and then branch out slowly into the neighborhood and start working on community skills as well. Um, and once they've got the community skills down, we'll put them in progressively more challenging situations with more traffic. Uh, we'll start going to businesses and services and start dealing with interacting with the community. Um, and then our final step in the curriculum is to work on technology, uh, there's a bunch of great applications that help navigation um, beyond just GPS. Um, and then of course use a public tra transportation because as a totally blind person you're not going to be able to drive a car. So being able to get to and from work and the other things you're going to be doing in your adult life is pretty key. And of course we talk about all the other skills that go along with that. You know, interacting with the public, we talk a lot about social skills, about what's appropriate to do in public, what's not appropriate to do in public. We talk a lot about personal safety. We do skills like managing money and shopping. Um, it's a nice way to tie in a bunch of different skills and base it around traveling to and from those destinations where they practice those skills. Hopefully by the time they graduate and they're moving on to their adult lives, they're prepared for whatever they want to do. 
So in the classroom, we, we sit towards the back of the classroom as both of these students are blind. We don't need to be closer to the front to see the board. So you're going to see that there's a lot of uh, mistakes in this uh, dialogue. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be editing it. So you're going to try to find the mistakes that they made. Very good. Okay. So you're going to read through this and copy this down in your Chromebook. You can title that Editing Dialogue Worksheet. What, what did you change on the computer? Yeah, you took, I took out that other quote and then made you just a comma. Because where does the comma belong? Right there after enough. Inside the Inside quotes, the right? Quotes. Yeah, good. And it was backwards. It was quotes then comma. So and then nice. I needs to be capitalized. Perfect. So I've got to erase that I. Today, the lesson was us working on the computer with our students, working on a language arts lesson about how to edit dialogue and making sure that. Uh, students know that you indent when a new person is speaking, adding quotation marks, and my job is to facilitate and make sure that students have access to that and learning how to do those things on the computer with their talking software and their braille display without being able to visually see the screen. All right? I like it. I like it too. Keep going. I love knowing that what we do makes a big impact on students and watching them be able to grow and develop and learn how to do things and be independent and successful and to show other people and for, for the students themselves to know even though I have a visual impairment I can still do all these things and I can do things that everybody else can do even if maybe I have to do it in a slightly different way I am capable and I am strong and I can be independent and successful. I like science and art. I like social studies because we um I am quite enjoying on work um working on the stuff we're working right now which is working on states and the capitals. We hope you have enjoyed this program. We'll close now with our calendar of educational events. Thank you for joining us, and we invite you to tune in next time for more Innovations in Education.